On January 1st, we commemorate the circumcision of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. St. Basil the Great, Archbishop of Caesarea in Cappadocia, Martyr Basil of Ancyra, St. Amelia, Mother of St. Basil the Great. The Circumcision of Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ On the eighth day after his nativity, our Lord Jesus Christ was circumcised in accordance with the Old Testament law. All male infants underwent circumcision as a sign of God's covenant with the Holy Forefather Abraham and his descendants. After this ritual, the divine infant was given the name Jesus, as the Archangel Gabriel declared on the day of the Annunciation to the Most Holy Theotokos. The fathers of the Church explained that the Lord, the Creator of the Law, underwent circumcision in order to give people an example of how faithfully the divine ordinances ought to be fulfilled. The Lord was circumcised so that later no one would doubt that He had truly assumed human flesh and that His incarnation was not merely an illusion, as certain heretics had taught. In the New Testament, the ritual of circumcision gave way to the mystery of baptism, which it prefigured. Accounts of the Feast of the Circumcision of the Lord continue in the Eastern Church right up through the 4th century. The canon of the feast was written by St. Stephen of the St. Saba Monastery. In addition to circumcision, which the Lord accepted as a sign of God's covenant with mankind, he also received the name Jesus, also known as Savior, on the eighth day after his nativity as an indication of his service, the work of the salvation of the world. These two events, the Lord's circumcision and naming, remind Christians that they have entered into a new covenant with God and are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. The very name Christian is a sign of mankind's entrance into a new covenant with God. St. Basil, the great Archbishop of Caesarea in Cappadocia, belongs not to the Church of Caesarea alone, nor merely to his own time, nor was he of benefit only to his own kinsmen, but rather to all lands and cities worldwide, and to all people he brought and still brings benefit. And for Christians, he always was and will be a most salvific teacher. Thus spoke St. Basil's contemporary, St. Amphilochius, Bishop of Iconium, St. Basil was born in the year 330 at Caesarea, the administrative center of Cappadocia. He was of illustrious lineage, famed for its eminence and wealth, and zealous for the Christian faith. The saint's grandfather and grandmother on his father's side had to hide in the forest of Pontus for seven years during the persecution under Diocletian. St. Basil's mother, St. Amelia, was the daughter of a martyr. On the Greek calendar, she is commemorated on May 30th. St. Basil's father was also named Basil. He was a lawyer and renowned rhetorician, and lived at Caesarea. Ten children were born to the elder Basil and Amelia, five sons and five daughters. Five of them were later numbered among the saints. Basil the Great, Macrina, commemorated July 19th, was an exemplar of ascetic life and exerted strong influence on the life and character of St. Basil the Great. Gregory, afterwards the Bishop of Nyssa, January 10th, Peter, Bishop of Sebast, January 9th, and Theosibia, a deaconess, commemorated on January 10th. St. Basil spent the first years of his life on an estate belonging to his parents at the River Iris, where he was raised under the supervision of his mother, Emilia, and grandmother, Macrina. They were women of great refinement, who remembered an earlier bishop of Cappadocia, St. Gregory the Wonderworker, commemorated on November 17th. Basil received his initial education under the supervision of his father, and then he studied under the finest teachers in Caesarea of Cappadocia, and it was here that he made the acquaintance of St. Gregory the Theologian, commemorated January 25th and January 30th. Later, Basil transferred to a school at Constantinople, where he listened to eminent orators and philosophers. To complete his education, St. Basil went to Athens, the center of classical enlightenment. After a four- or five-year stay at Athens, Basil had mastered all the available disciplines. He studied everything thoroughly, more than others are wont to study a single subject. He studied each science in its very totality, as though he would study nothing else. Philosopher, philologist, orator, jurist, naturalist, 
possessing profound knowledge in astronomy, mathematics, and medicine. He was a ship fully laden with learning, to the extent permitted by human nature. At Athens, a close friendship developed between Basil the Great and Gregory the Theologian, which continued throughout their life. In fact, they regarded themselves as one soul and two bodies. Later on in his eulogy for Basil the Great, St. Gregory the Theologian speaks with delight about this period. Various hopes guided us, and indeed inevitably in learning. Two paths opened up before us, the one to our sacred temples and the teachers therein, the other towards preceptors of disciplines beyond. About the year 357, St. Basil returned to Caesarea, where for a while he devoted himself to rhetoric, but soon Refusing offers from Caesarea's citizens who wanted to entrust him with the education of their offspring, St. Basil entered upon the path of ascetic life. After the death of her husband, Basil's mother, her eldest daughter Macrina, and several female servants withdrew to the family estate at Iris, and there began to lead an ascetic life. Basil was baptized by Dionios, the bishop of Caesarea, and was tonsured a reader on the Holy Spirit on the 29th. He first read the Holy Scriptures to the people, then explained them. Later on, wishing to acquire a guide to the knowledge of truth, the saint undertook a journey into Egypt, Syria, and Palestine to meet the great Christian ascetics dwelling there. On returning to Cappadocia, he decided to do as they did. He distributed his wealth to the needy, then settled on the opposite side of the river, not far from his mother, Emilia, and sister, Macrina, gathering around him monks living a Cenobitic life. By his letters, Basil drew his good friend Gregory the Theologian to the monastery. St. Basil and Gregory labored in strict abstinence in their dwelling place, which had no roof or fireplace, and the food was very humble. They themselves cleared away the stones, planted and watered the trees, and carried heavy loads. Their hands were constantly calloused from the hard work. For clothing, Basil had only a tunic and a monastic mantle. He wore a hair shirt but only at night, so that it would not be obvious. In their solitude, St. Basil and Gregory occupied themselves in an intense study of Holy Scripture. They were guided by the writings of the fathers and commentators of the past, especially the good writings of Oregon. From all these works, they compiled an anthology called Philokalia. Also at this time, at the request of the monks, St. Basil wrote down a collection of rules for virtuous life. By his preaching and by his example, St. Basil assisted in the spiritual perfection of Christians in Cappadocia and Pontus, and many indeed turned to him. Monasteries were organized for men and for women, in which places Basil sought to combine the Cenobitic lifestyle with that of the solitary hermit. During the reign of Constantinus, from 337 to 361, the heretical teachings of Arius were spreading, and the Church summoned both its saints into service. St. Basil returned to Caesarea. In the year 362, he was ordained deacon by Bishop Meletius of Antioch. In 364, he was ordained to the holy priesthood by Bishop Eusebius of Caesarea. But seeing, as Gregory the Theologian relates, that everyone exceedingly praised and honored Basil for his wisdom and reverence, Eusebius, through human weakness, succumbed to jealousy of him and began to show dislike for him. The monks rose up in defense of St. Basil. To avoid causing church discord, Basil withdrew to his own monastery and concerned himself with the organization of monasteries. With the coming to power of the Emperor Valens from 364 to 378, who was a resolute adherent of Arianism, a time of troubles began for orthodoxy, the onset of a great struggle. St. Basil hastily returned to Caesarea at the request of Bishop Eusebius. In the words of Gregory the Theologian, he was for Bishop Eusebius a good advisor, a righteous representative, an expounder of the word of God, a staff for the aged, a faithful support in internal matters, and an activist in external matters. From this time, church governance passed over to Basil, though he was subordinate to the hierarch. He preached daily and often twice, in the morning and in the evening. During this time, St. Basil composed his liturgy. He wrote a work on the six days of creation, Hexaimeron, and another on the prophet Isaiah in 16 chapters, yet another on the Psalms, and also a second compilation of monastic rules. St. Basil wrote also three books against Eunomius, an Arian teacher who, with the help of Aristotelian concepts, had presented the Arian dogma in philosophic form. 
converting Christian teaching into a logical scheme of rational concepts. St. Gregory the Theologian, speaking about the activity of Basil the Great during this period, points to the caring for the destitute and the taking in of strangers, the supervision of virgins, written and unwritten monastic rules for monks, the arrangement of prayers, the divine liturgy, the felicitous arrangement of altars and other things. Upon the death of Eusebius, the bishop of Caesarea, St. Basil was chosen to succeed him in the year 370. As bishop of Caesarea, St. Basil the Great was the newest of 50 bishops in 11 provinces. St. Athanasius the Great, commemorated on May 2nd, with joy and with thanks to God, welcomed the appointment of Cappadocia of such a bishop as Basil. Famed for his reverence, deep knowledge of Holy Scripture, great learning, and his efforts for the welfare of church, peace, and unity. Under Valens, the external government belonged to the Arians, who held various opinions regarding the divinity of the Son of God and were divided into several factions. These dogmatic disputes were concerned with questions about the Holy Spirit. In his books against Eunomius, St. Basil the Great taught the divinity of the Holy Spirit and his equality with the Father and the Son. Subsequently, in order to provide a full explanation of Orthodox teaching on this question, St. Basil wrote his book on the Holy Spirit at the request of St. Amphilochius, the Bishop of Iconium. St. Basil's difficulties were made worse by various circumstances. Cappadocia was divided in two under the rearrangement of provincial districts. Then, at Antioch, a schism occurred occasioned by the consecration of a second bishop. There was the negative and haughty attitude of Western bishops to the attempts to draw them into the struggle with the Arians. And there was also the departure of Eustathius of Sebast over to the Arian side. Basil had been connected to him by ties of close friendship. Amidst the constant peril, St. Basil gave encouragement to the Orthodox, confirmed them in the faith, summoning them to bravery and endurance. The holy bishop wrote numerous letters to the churches, to bishops, to clergy, and to individuals, overcoming the heretics, by the weapon of his mouth and by the arrows of his letters. As an untiring champion of orthodoxy, St. Basil challenged the hostility and intrigues of the Arian heretics all his life. He has been compared to a bee, stinging the church's enemies, yet nourishing his flock with the sweet honey of his teaching. The Emperor of Valens mercilessly sending into exile any bishop who displeased him, and having implanted Arianism into other Asia Minor provinces, suddenly appeared in Cappadocia for the same purpose. He sent the prefect Modestus to St. Basil. He began to threaten the saint with confiscation of his property, banishment, beatings, and even death. St. Basil said, If you take away my possessions, you will not enrich yourself, nor will you make me a pauper. You have no need of my old worn-out clothing nor of my few books, of which the entirety of my wealth is comprised. Exile means nothing to me, since I am bound to no particular place. This place in which I now dwell is not mine, and any place you send me shall be mine. Better to say, every place is God's. Where would I be, neither a stranger and sojourner? Who can torture me? I am so weak that the very first blow would render me insensible. Death would be a kindness to me for it will bring me all the sooner to God, for whom I live and labor, and to whom I hasten. The official was stunned by his answer. No one has ever spoken so audaciously to me, he said. Perhaps, the saint remarked, that is because you've never spoken to a bishop before. In all else, we are meek, the most humble of all, but when it concerns God, and people rise up against him, then we, counting everything else as not, look to him alone. Then fire, sword, wild beasts, and iron rods that rend the body served to fill us with joy rather than fear. Reporting to Valens that St. Basil was not to be intimidated, Modesta said, Emperor, we stand defeated by a leader of the church. Basil the Great again showed firmness before the emperor, and his retinue had made such a strong impression on Valens that the emperor dared not give in to the Arians demanding Basil's exile. On the day of Theophany, amidst an innumerable multitude of the people, Valens entered the church and mixed in with the throng in order to give the appearance of being in unity with the church. When the singing of psalms began in the church, it was like thunder to his hearing. The emperor beheld the sea of people, and in the altar and all round was splendor, in front of all was Basil, who acknowledged neither by gesture nor by glance that anything else was going on in the church. Everything was focused only on God and the altar table, and the clergy serving there in awe and reverence.
St. Basil celebrated the church services almost every day. He was particularly concerned about the strict fulfilling of the canons of the church, and took care that only worthy individuals should enter into the clergy. He incessantly made the rounds of his own church, lest anywhere there be an infraction of church discipline, any setting aright, any unseemlessness. At Caesarea, St. Basil built two monasteries, a man's and a woman's, with a church in honor of the forty martyrs whose relics were buried there. Following the example of monks, the saints' clergy, and even deacons and priests lived in remarkable poverty to toil and lead chaste and virtuous lives. For his clergy, St. Basil obtained an exemption from taxation. He used all his personal wealth and the income from his church for the benefit of the destitute. In every center of his diocese, he built a poor house, and at Caesarea, a home for wanderers and the homeless. Sickly since youth, the toil of teaching, his life of abstinence, and the concerns and sorrows of pastoral service took their toll on him. St. Basil died on January 1st, 379, at the age of 49. Shortly before his death, the saint blessed St. Gregory the Theologian to accept the see of Constantinople. Upon the repose of St. Basil, the church immediately began to celebrate his memory. St. Amphilochios, Bishop of Iconium, commemorated on November 23rd, in his eulogy to St. Basil the Great said, It is neither without a reason nor by chance that Holy Basil has taken leave from the body and had repose from the world unto God on the day of circumcision of Jesus celebrated between the day of the Nativity and the day of the Baptism of Christ. Therefore, this most blessed one, preaching and praising the Nativity of, and Baptism of Christ, extolling spiritual circumcision, himself forsaking the flesh, now ascends to Christ on the sacred day of remembrance of the circumcision of Christ. Therefore, let it be also established on this present day, annually to the honor and the memory of Basil the Great, festively and with solemnity. St. Basil is also called the Revealer of Heavenly Mysteries, a renowned and bright star, and the glory and beauty of the Church. His honorable head is in the great laver on Mount Athos. In some countries it is customary to sing special carols today in honor of St. Basil. He is believed to visit the homes of the unfaithful, and a place is set for him at the table. People visit the homes of friends and relatives, and the mistress of the house gives a small gift to the children, a special bread, by Siropita, is blessed and distributed after the liturgy. A silver coin is baked into the bread, and whoever receives the slice of the coin is said to receive the blessing of St. Basil for the coming year. The martyr St. Basil of Ancyra lived in the time of Julian the Apostate, who ruled from 331 to 363, and confessed his faith in Christ before the governor Saturninus. St. Basil was tortured in Ancyra, then sent to Constantinople, where he was suspended from a tree, stretched on a rack, beaten, then stabbed with red-hot needles. He was also thrown into a fiery furnace, but was not harmed. He was sent to Caesarea, and was torn to pieces by lions in the arena. This saint, a layman, should not be confused with other St. Basils, nor the other St. Basil of Ancyra, who was a priest, and is commemorated on March 22nd. St. Amelia, the mother of St. Basil the Great, is also commemorated on January 1st. She was the daughter of a martyr. This martyr, her mother, is commemorated on May 30th on the Greek calendar. St. Amelia, along with her husband, the elder Basil, who was a lawyer and renowned rhetorician and lived at Caesarea, bore ten children, five sons and five daughters. Five of them were later numbered among the saints. These five saints included Basil the Great, commemorated today, Macrina, commemorated July 19th, who was an exemplar of ascetic life and exerted strong influence on the life and character of St. Basil, Gregory, who was Bishop of Nyssa, commemorated on January 10th, Peter, Bishop of Sebast, commemorated January 9th, and Theosibia, a deaconess, commemorated on January 10th.